Hey there. You are here probably because you want to find out why you play video games. Good job on reading the title of the video correctly, but let me clarify some things. I'm not about to explain to you how being an INTJ coincides with why you like playing League of Legends over Dota, or why Animal Crossing is such a chill game for chill gamers. No. Your rare 1% personality type drop on Myers-Briggs predicts as much as your horoscope. But then, what exactly draws you to a specific game? A specific genre? Is it really your personality? Is it simply preference? Or much more than that? My name is Pengus, or you can just call me Donnie, and today, we're going to answer, why do you play video games? This is a loaded question that game developers have been trying to answer since the dawn of time. It is in their best interest to segment their target audiences and what kinds of gamers would play their game. For example, this infamous taxonomy of player types by Richard Bartle in 1996 arbitrarily categorizes players, a core concept to gamer psychology. To quickly explain this graph, killers like to kill, achievers like to achieve, Socializers like to socialize. What the hell is with your boy? Your mom's boy. And explorers like to explore. It's gonna be a fun time and arguably the best one hour of my life. Um. Yeah, it's that obvious. What is less obvious, though, is what's missing from this graph. Let's say someone isn't an achiever. Does that automatically make them a socializer? Of course not. Well, how do we account for this? Moving away from achievers automatically categorizes a player into other types, when, as you should have figured by now, isn't as simple. Well, Nick Yi from Quantic Foundry addresses this exact problem. There is negative space missing from this graph, a spot for players that don't really fit in anywhere. His team came up with these metrics that address player preferences rather than categorizing players themselves. The meat of this video will be explaining the 12 motivations Quantic Foundry has come up with. If you are interested, you can take the survey yourself and see if you agree with the results. I'll put the link in the description down below. Before I explain further, the most important concept we must first understand is this is a motivation spectrum rather than a thermometer. What I mean by that is a thermometer has two directions, low and high, relative to a standard. This is an outdated psychology profile and lumps categories too liberally, as seen in the Bartle taxonomy earlier. An example is categorizing introverts versus extroverts. Typically, introverts score low on social profiles, but that has negative implications when obviously that doesn't mean introverts straight up have less personality. But what these 12 motivations offer is a spectrum. Scoring low doesn't mean it's a bad thing, nor does scoring too high. There are natural trade-offs, but it allows us to identify those non-achievers mentioned earlier. Anyways, let's dive into these 12 motivations to see how games have started to offer different types of motivating factors for players. There are three motivation clusters making it easier to interpret player profiles. Each pair has two categories, and those categories themselves have spectrums. Let's start with the action-social pair. Those who score high on action and social love immediacy and adrenaline rushes. They want to be excited, either with other players or by the game itself. Action Action is comprised of destruction and excitement. Destruction is entropy, or the concept in physics of lack of order and unpredictability. Games that are high on destruction are chaotic. Halo, Call of Duty, Battlefield, etc. Your typical shooter with, well, destruction. The opposite end of this spectrum is enduring. Games that are PG, like Animal Crossing or Harvest Moon. You get the picture. Excitement is novelty. The high end of the spectrum is thrilling. Games like CSGO, Bullets Per Minute, and Monster Hunter World. Fast paced and surprising with every playthrough. The low end is calming. Games like Civilization and Stardew Valley that don't require quick reflexes or get your heart pumping. 
Obviously, some games will spill into other categories, but the difference between destruction and excitement is what kind of action there is. An example of a game with low destruction and high excitement would be Rocket League. Fast-paced and surprising, but not much destruction. Well, sometimes. An example I can think to be high in destruction and low in excitement would be Besiege. You build at your own pace, and it can even be calming at times, but once you hit the play button, you wreak havoc. Social Social deals with competition and community. Competition is social comparison. High on the spectrum are high conflict games, versing other players with rankings and leaderboards like classic MOBA League of Legends, Dota 2, or CSGO. The opposite end of the spectrum are games where you play with other players but are non-adversarial or offer no competition, like Human Fall Flat or Journey. Community is a shared experience. High in the spectrum are games with teamwork like Destiny, Rainbow Six Siege, or Overcooked. Low on the spectrum are defined as independent or purely single player games like Grease or Game Dev Tycoon. I think the difference is a little harder to discern between these two categories. Typically, multiplayer games fall somewhere between the extremes, like how League of Legends requires both teamwork and has high competition. With that said, multiplayer games in all forms can draw in very different players, from casual overcooked friends to sweaty CSGO global elites. Let's talk a little more about Action Social as a cluster. What might make a person more predetermined to score high or low in these categories? We'll delve into a little psychology here. Studies on infant temperament, or a person's innate nature, has repeatedly shown accurate results predicting temperament as early as at the age of 4 months, and predictions being accurate 15 years later. Infants that show behavioral inhibition, or avoid unfamiliar things and display social withdrawal, tend to be introverted in their later life. How an infant already develops their innate temperament is still up in the air for research, but like I said earlier, being introverted doesn't mean you will fall into a gaming category. However, a general personality temperament might be able to predict why someone may score high or low in the action social motivation cluster, and that might simply be their nature. Just some food for thought next time you browse for your next game on Steam. We move on to the Mastery Achievement Couple. Mastery and Achievement are more about being methodical, strategic, and long-term gaming. Gamers here also like gradual mechanics, like watching cities or farms grow. Mastery Mastery is about challenge and strategy. Challenge is skill improvement. High in the spectrum are games that are skill-based, with steep learning curves and are complex, such as Melee, Osu, or Street Fighter V. Low in this spectrum are games known as easy fun, like Stardew Valley or Balloons Tower Defense 6, with low skill barriers and straightforward mechanics. Strategy is decision complexity. Games like StarCraft II, Crusader Kings 2, and EVE Online are contemplative, or require long-term strategies and planning. The opposite are spontaneous games, like The Sims or Mario Kart, that don't require complex plans. Let's address the fact that, obviously, games can be played in a variety of different ways. Playing The Sims, you can either go with the flow, or plan an elaborate murder scheme. You can also play Melee like how it was intended to be played, you filthy casual with items. Just kidding. Naturally, we take the most popular way to play as ways to define these games, but as is the point of the video, player preferences vary in how they both perceive and play their favorite games. Achievement Achievement is about power and completion. The power category is about growth. Progression-based games like World of Warcraft, Diablo 3, or Path of Exile start your character very weak, and the whole point basically is to get stronger via skills, weapons, armor, etc. The opposite end of this is a flat progression. Seen in games like Rocket League or Skater XL, characters are the exact same from the start, and all players are at an even playing field. The completion category is about the source of goals. 
This focuses on a task-oriented approach in the high end, like in Pokemon, Baba's You, or Ghost Runner. You complete tasks or quests to complete the game or get collectibles for achievements. The opposite end of this category are self-driven goals, found in open world or sandbox games like City Skylines or Raft, where the end goal isn't necessarily defined for you and players make their goals themselves. Let's take a pause here and consider cultural implications. Is all of this data the same across all gamers? As with most superlatives, the answer is no. All of the data taken here can be vastly different in other cultures. Let's listen to Nick Yi talking about the difference in preferences between the US and China. So we talk a lot about gender gaming differences in the West in the, in the American context, but what this data is kind of hinting and surfacing is that perhaps the gender differences in gaming that we see in the West may be unique to the West, and that this would also imply that they could be entirely an artifact of culture and marketing and historical idiosyncrasies without really needing to invoke biology. But there, there are two things that struck out for us when Nico Partners and, and, and we were looking through this data. The difference, especially in competition, goes against traditional assumptions between individualist versus collectivist societies. So previous cultural findings in academia would have predicted that a more individualist society like the US should score higher on competition. But we're finding here the exact opposite. The second point is that the Chinese gaming market has been able to develop in a semi-isolated manner due to a variety of governmental regulations, such as the ban until recently on Western consoles, the cultural review of content, the Great Firewall. Net cafe culture has also encouraged greater adoption of specific genres of games, such as online multiplayer games. And of course, the Chinese market makes its own games, a large number of them, in fact. So part of what we're seeing may stem from the different sensibilities and emphasis that their games have and how their gamers have historically adopted gaming. So for example, many popular Chinese games aren't available or known in the US market. So these two populations aren't really even playing the same games to begin with. That had to be one of my favorite parts of this discussion. All of this data could just simply be completely different for other countries and cultures. And it is, at least between the US and China. Even the differences between male and female gamers in the US and China are different. There are differences in the differences. Yeah. Let's move on to our final pair, Immersion and Creativity. Immersion and creativity are about being broad and expansive. Players here are curious and test the boundaries of the game. Immersion Immersion's two categories are fantasy and story. Fantasy is suspending disbelief. Games that excel in this have deep lore like in Mass Effect, Fallout, or The Witcher. The low end of fantasy would be games that are in generic or abstract settings with minimal world building like Counter-Strike or Planet Coaster. I mean, you tell me, which environment is more enthralling, Counter-Strike or The Witchers? Story in games is about the web of human drama. We've all played scripted drama games like Persona 4, Danganronpa, or Death Stranding. Their focus is their linear story. And of course, the opposite of this are open-ended games like Satisfactory and Terraria, with no real direction for the story and it's up to interpretation. Creativity Creativity's categories are design and discovery. Design is about expressing individuality. Obviously, games with customizability are on the high end of the spectrum, like Animal Crossing, The Sims, and Minecraft. The opposite, then, are games defined as curated, or simply have few customization options, like in Super Meat Boy and Mario 64. Discovery is about the unknowns. Exploring curious worlds like in Skyrim, Subnautica, or Breath of the Wild allows players to experiment and find hidden secrets. The opposite would be practical games like Call of Duty or Plague Inc, where an expansive world isn't their focus. Nick Yi makes a very interesting point about VR and fantasy here. You initially might imagine why people buy VR is for immersion motivations, right? 
Well, actually it's not. Out of 2400 people, their initial motivations to buy high-end VR setups like the HTC Vive or Oculus were actually destruction and excitement. When you think about it, there are a ton of VR games with action. Boneworks, Superhot, Pavlov, etc. We can now think about the socio-economic implications of this. VR is expensive, obviously. So gamers with a higher disposable income can afford VR, but those with higher disposable income are older in age. The kicker? Older gamers' inclinations for action drop significantly. In summary, those who can afford VR have less motivation for VR, at least initially. In One Step Further, when asked about what keeps VR gamers satisfied with their purchase and consistently engaged, however, fantasy does win out of all the categories, as seen here. The analogy is, what gets people through the door is not the same as what keeps them happy once they're inside. Fantasy may not be the leading factor to get people to adopt VR, but the gamers that do score high in fantasy are more likely to be satisfied with VR. This is also some more food for thought in case you are looking into your next VR game's target audience or you are also just in the market for a VR game. Writing this script and reflecting on how much I play VR, I actually resonate with this. I have played Boneworks and Superhot for just a few hours to finish them. Meanwhile, I have 483 hours in VR chat. Yeah. I love my fair share of mutes, don't judge. That was a ton of games. If you spotted one of your favorite games, you should ask yourself, why do I like this game? Do I like games similar to this? And perhaps you can find your next addiction. Exploring gamer motivations in a statistical, psychological, socio-economical, cultural, and even sometimes biological manner can help not just game developers design the overall concept and marketing for their games, but for consumers like me to find their own taste and perhaps experiment with games they never thought to try. Again, I suggest you take Quantic Foundry's Gamer Motivation Survey, and I'll include a link in the description. Of course, it is just a survey and that can't capture an entire human psyche, so take it with a grain of salt. Personally, I got Gladiator, or a hardcore gamer that likes mastery. Although they grouped me a bit with the destruction category, while I don't really enjoy genetic shooters, I really do love mastering games. For fun, I learned how to speedrun Katana Zero a while back. I used to be top 1000 in the US in Osu. I love beating roguelikes. Whenever my brother and I play games like Factorio or Satisfactory, we min-max the hell out of it. Hell, when I play Stardew Valley, I min-max that shit too. With all of this information in mind, why do you play video games? Like any good research conclusion, it's safe to say we have no fucking idea. Um. But we do have some clues with this data and theories. Keep in mind, when I initially wanted to write this video, I was going to cover other motivational factors and other theorist classifications, but there is just too many out there. It isn't as simple as the type of government, economics, or personality, or the right classifications. All of this wasn't for nothing though. In a somewhat different fashion from my other videos, I hope you discovered something new about yourself rather than your favorite games. This was Why You Play Video Games, and if you enjoyed this video, then consider subscribing to my channel for more videos like this. It's free, it takes one click, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Stay motivated, stay tuned for future videos, and I'll see you all next time.